Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're taking off in chapter 24. I want to do a little recap because it has been it has been a season since we've been in 1 Samuel. And I actually want to recap clear back to where um, to where David started. This is going to be a quick recap. Trust me, guys. Quick. Where David started basically running. He became a fugitive from Saul. Saul's jealousy towards David made him and caused David to be this fugitive, a man on the run. And we see all the way. This is the thing I really want to point out. And as I go through this, look at this, how David... As he was being moved, God was transporting him basically from place to place. I want to say God was transporting him, you know. He was moving him around. He was always one step ahead of Saul. That was pretty cool, man. He was always one step ahead. You know, it started where, where uh, Saul told his son Jonathan, David surely must die, right? And Jonathan knew at that time, hey, there is no way we're going to work this out again. And so he goes out there and he shoots those arrows. You guys remember that? He shoots the arrows out there and tells the young lad, hey, it's way out there. And that told David, get out of Dodge. Get out of here. And he goes to Nob. When in this town of Nob, that's where the tabernacle was. Remember, and he met Ahimelech there. He meets Ahimelech, the high priest. And he gets the provisions. He lies his way. Oh, man, that was a bad time for David. That was not looking good for David then. He wasn't looking very godly. But the whole thing is also this man Doeg. Doeg, who worked for Saul. He was his herdsman. He saw David there. He saw David at that tabernacle, if you remember. And then David, he has to leave there because, because Saul hears about him in that town and he leaves there. And where does he go? He goes to the Philistine camp of all places. He goes to the King Achish and he ends up there at that Philistine camp. And then he's got to act like a crazy man because, you know, the Philistines are his enemy. He is the Philistines' enemy. And then we catch him after he leaves there. He goes to the cave Adul. Now, guys, this is where David started coming back to the Lord. This is where David had a connection. I called it his sanctuary. He went in that cave. He went before the Lord. I believe, I mean, it didn't read that, but I believe he had that time with God, and God spoke to me. He had that time to reconnect with the Lord in this cave of doom. But he wasn't there long before his family shows up, right? Because they got to get out of Dodge, too, because Saul's on the rampage, plus four under... 400 other men join him in that cave of doom. And they're all great in there. But then along comes this prophet Gad. Prophet Gad comes and tells David, you got to go back to Judah, back to where Saul's at, right? Now you got to go back to Judah. He didn't want to go there, but he obeyed, see? Now he was connecting with God. Now he was obeying. Go back to, go back to Judah, and he hides out in this forest of Hareth. David obeyed the Lord. Like I say, he didn't really want to go there. And then Saul finds out. He finds out where he's at, right? And he's in Judah. He's in his own land. And he starts beating up the Benjamites saying, you dirty Benjamites, why didn't you tell me? You didn't feel sorry for me. Why didn't you tell me about this whole, you know, uh, promise between David and my son Jonathan? Why didn't you tell me of this covenant that was made? And he blames the people. And then Doeg, this was, a, this was a terrible part. Remember Doeg, the Edomite? Then he steps up and he says, you know what? I'll take care of this for you. And he, by the order of Saul, he slays all the priests of Nob. He slays them all. 85 priests in all. 85 priests. Not only does he slay all these priests, but then he goes into Nob and kills everything. Nursing infants right down to the babies. This wicked man, Doeg, but only one escapes. You remember the guy who escaped? It was uh, uh, Ahimelech's son, Ahimelech's son, Abiathar. And he escapes and he gets to David and he tells him the whole story. Guys, remember that. That was a hard time for David. His sorrow, his repentance, because he knew he was responsible. He was responsible for all these priests' deaths because he lied. He didn't let Ahimelech have an honorable death, at least that for sure. And then after that, the Philistines are attacking Keilah. We remember that. They're attacking this town, and and then David inquires of the Lord, and he says, 
well, should I go there? And the Lord says, yes. And his men said, no, we don't want to go. We're small numbers and stuff. But he inquires of the Lord's again, and he goes. And he tells him, yes, go. And he leads an attack upon these Philistines that are attacking this town of Keilah. And he has great victory. And then he inquires of the Lord about the men in Keilah. Because remember, he asked, he asked the Lord, hey, where are they going to give me up? God said, yep, they're going to give you up. They're going to give you up to Saul. So now he's got to get out of there. And now David goes to the, the mountain of Ziph. Guys, he's one step ahead, you know. Here comes Saul. Better move. Here comes Saul. David hides in the mountain of Ziph. And Jonathan comes there and encourages him. That was a cool part. Jonathan showed up to encourage David. Encourage him in the Lord, it said. By the way, that was the last meeting Jonathan is ever going to have with David. Jonathan will be killed in the battlefield. They'll never see each other again. These two brothers of brothers, man. So anyway, they go to the land of Ziph. And then what happens? The darn Ziphites betray him. And the Ziphites, they tell Saul where his hiding place is. And so then David moves to this wilderness of Ma Maon. M-A-O-N. Maon. And there we find at we seen the last time we taught, here was Saul on this side of the mountain with his thousands of men. And here was David on this side of the mountain with, with his 600, or, yeah, 600 men now. And Saul was encircling around. And for sure, David's going to get caught, right? What happens? God puts a distraction there. God puts a distraction right in front of Saul and allows David to escape. And as we read last time, he actually escaped to En Gedi. We read that in chapter 23, 27. It says, but a messenger came to Saul, just as he's ready to pounce on David. But a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore, Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called the place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in the strongholds of En Gedi. En Gedi. All these narrow escapes, right? I mean, seriously, all these narrow escapes, circumstantial events that took place. You know, David, David staying one step ahead of Saul, I want to say. Must have. I got to only think that it must have let David know that God was in control of it all. You know, kind of like, kind of like a chessboard, guys. You know, and here's all the pawns and the bishops, kings, queens, and everything. And God says, okay, here, okay, here, okay, here, okay, here. You know, kind of like a chessboard. God was in control. You know, for our lives too, I don't think we understand it enough. How much God intercedes in our lives. I think we need more awareness of how many times God is interceding in our life. We need to take heart in the, the fact that God is very present in our lives. In the Christian's life, he is very present. And he, and he does make those moves, those things before, in our lives, and, and what we might call chance or circumstances, right? Whether we're moving either with God or actually against God as Christians. What I'm saying is that you're backsliding away from God. God can make moves. He makes those moves and he's very present. Whether th things seem good or things seem bad, God is still present. God is present and in control. And he uses all those moves for those who love him. He uses all those moves for his glory, church. For his name's sake. Isn't that incredible? For him. Romans 8.27 and it says, and now, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus is making intercession. He's, he's making intercession for us. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. All things, church. All things work together. Man, have you seen that in your life? I've seen what I consider bad things and God flipping around. And it's like, wow, how did he do that, right? All things work together for good, those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Church, all things, whether you're moving with God or in our flesh, you know, 
Sometimes God will take those moves in our flesh and he'll turn them around and all of a sudden there'll be glory to God. Whether there be smart moves on our part or ignorant ones, whether we see it as good or bad, God can be in control and he can do what he wants. God uses it. And you know the porch, what I like to point out, he uses it just for you. He uses it, he does it just for you. And we now need to understand, we have a personal God who cares about each and every one of us individually. Very personal God. Oh, he loves the whole world. I agree, he loves the whole world, but he's personal. Jesus died on that cross for you. Jesus died on that cross just for me. You need to make it personal, church. You need to understand that it's for you. All for his glory, right? Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, pray, and we're going to get into tonight's message. Boy, that was a long interlude. I don't know if I'll get through this. We'll try. <laughs> Father God, we just thank you, Lord. <sighs> thank you that you are a personal God. Thank you, Jesus. You are so personal with me too, Lord, that our relationship should be a personal relationship, God. It's not about religion. Lord, it's not about large groups. It's about one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano, between you and us. Father, speak to your children tonight. Speak to us, God, through your word. Our ears are open, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is, oh, you're not going to like this one. You're not going to like this one, guys. Godly humility and godly sorrow. Oh, I told you you wouldn't like it. Mm. we're going to see that. You know, we need that in our lives. Yes. As Christians, we need godly humility, and we need godly sorrow. We're going to see that with, uh, as we study tonight. So David and his men are now in En Gedi. En Gedi. It's a stronghold up in a huge canyon. My wife and I have had the opportunity to actually go to Israel a couple times. And this is one of the places we've been to a couple times. Amazing. You're down way down by the Dead Sea. It's just nasty, nasty, rugged mountain desert. Ugly, ugly, ugly. And you go up in this huge, I want to say a canyon. It, uh, it's large. This huge valley canyon, almost a box canyon up in there. And it turns into this lush oasis. Just Gorgeous up in there. Big, huge cliffs and caves and stuff like that. Water just running. They're out in the middle of the ugly desert. And, it, and this is En Gedi with very large caves. And they used these caves back in that time. And I think they actually still use some of it today this way uh, for sheep folds and things of that nature. Where the shepherds will take their sheep in there during the bad weather or at night and stuff like that. And they could keep them in these caves. So he's up in En Gedi. And Getty stands for spring of the kid. Now, that's not a kid like a child. That's a kid like a goat. Spring of the kid or the fountain of the young goat. It's basically an oasis in the desert. Now, how you pronounce it, I don't know. I think it's Ibec. But they have these Ibec goats in there, too. And you're going to see those things. I mean, they're up on the cliffs, they're just bouncing around like, how do they do this? You'll see them up in the trees, even, sitting up in a tree. And I'm going, what's that goat doing in the tree? But anyway. Hmm. Chapter uh, 24. As they're in and getting. Now it happened, when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men. Guys, 3,000. Here David is. He's got 600 men plus himself. 601, I guess. And Saul grabs on to 3,000 chosen men. These are men of battle. 3,000 of them from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Saul and his men. First they went after the Philistines, right? Right? That was the distraction. They had to go after these Philistines first, chase them off. They were coming into the, the territory of the Jews there, or the Israelites, I should say. They're coming into this territory, and so they had to chase them off. But immediately after, I mean immediately after he's gone after these Philistines, he returns to pursue David. He goes back after David. David's escape 
was temporary. It was just a temporary escape. He had a, I guess you want to say, a temporary victory. Guys, when we have a victory, a victory in a trial or maybe over a temptation even, right? We would like that victory to be permanent, wouldn't we? Don't we like it to be permanent? It'd be nice if that victory that we have will be permanent. That enemy never to return, that temptation never to come before us again. (laughs) Right? The victory to be permanent. Spiritual enemies. You know, there's a spiritual realm, those spiritual enemies that pursue and they would never return again. Man, don't we want that? I want to tell you, short of heaven, it won't happen. Church, I'm sorry to say, short of heaven, it will not happen. Our enemy will pursue and attack time and time and time again. Time and time again. In 1 Peter, it says, chapter 5, verse 8, be sober. Now, sober doesn't mean don't be drunk. Okay, well, don't be drunk also, guys, okay? Sober means be right-minded, right-thinking. Well, if you're drunk, you can't be right-thinking, so you see, you can't be drunk either. Be sober, be vigilant, on guard. Be sober, be vigilant, think rightly, be on guard, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, church, time and time again. Resist him, it says. Resist him steadfast. How? In the faith. In trusting in God. In trusting in God and in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. There again, there ain't nothing new under the sun. We all have those things. We have the the enemy, the temptations before us. uh, those, Those trials that come at us. The pursuit of our enemy, I want to say, can be very relentless, church. Very relentless, especially when he has you on the run. (laughs) It can even be a little more relentless when he has you on the run. But God, always remember, but God, he is able to sustain us, sustain you through that trial. God is more than able to give you victory again. Even if you lost a little ground, man, you lost a little ground, he can give you victory again. God will always make an escape, right? Remember that verse I read on Sunday? You guys, if you, if, you don't, uh, if you haven't highlighted it, underlined it, or whatever, do that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation, like I tell you, you can put trial there too, a trial or a temptation, has overtaken you as such as, such as common to man. There again, nothing new under the sun. We all have those temptations. We all have those things come against us. But God is faithful. It's trusting in God. God is faithful. We're not faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with a temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There's that way out. That way way out of that temptation, that way out of that trial, that attack, the enemy's attack. See, David would have liked to thought that Saul's pursuit, right, was over. I think David knew better. He knew better than that. He knew Saul's pursuit wasn't going to be over. In verse 3, we read there, So he came to the sheepfolds. This is Saul, right? Now Saul comes to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in and attended to his needs. And David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. (laughs) You know, I love the Word of God. I love this book. You know, this book speaks about real people and real things. This speak, it speaks about, it deals with real people. Even the fact that Saul needed to go in this cave and relieve himself. He needed to go in there and use the restroom. That's why he's going in the cave, attending to his needs. He went into there, hey, there's a good place. I can get out of the sight of my 3,000 men, right? Pull my drawers down and do my business, right? I love the fact that word of God is real people. Guys, this is, this is truth. This is history. <laughs> what are the chances, though? Think about this. There's many caves up in, up in those mountains, up in that huge valley. There's many different caves up there. What are the chances that here comes Saul, and he's going to walk in to the exact same cave David and his 600 men in? There's some big caves up there, too. They're hiding in that cave. 
what's the chance that Saul's going to use that one for his restroom? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> you know, I think, you know, the fact of the matter is, there again, we speak about God and his moving the chess pieces, you know, allowing things to happen. God set this up. Guys, we're going to see. God set this up. He set this up to test and train David, to train him to be that king he's going to be. We will see. To check his, David's godly heart, whether he had a godly heart or not, right? He's going to check him. You know, too many times uh, we might think that it's just a chance meeting. You know how that is. A chance meeting with a particular person, a chance opportunity maybe even. Oh, that's just by chance, you know. It just happened to happenstance, right? Just that oppor opportunity of life that might be by chance that you, really? <laughs> you know, really? Seriously, the more I walk with the Lord, the more I see there is nothing God doesn't have his hand on. Doesn't have his hand on. Just that chance. You know, there's been people in this community some people in this community I've wanted the opportunity to speak to. And I know God will open up that opportunity. You know, the other day, Monday, when it snowed really bad, a particular gentleman who I've been wanting to speak to and, and just spend some time with, well, he couldn't get from Prescott back down to Wilhoy because his car wouldn't go through the snow. And so I got a telephone call. I said, yeah, I'll go pick him up. And I, boy, you got to drive slow on them spars in the snow. You gotta drive really slow. It, it might take you 45 minutes even to get down that hill. What a time of conversation we had. It was wonderful. Was that just by happenstance? No. I want to tell you, church, that was not just by happenstance. God set that up. Yeah. And He'll set it up again and again and again. Understand that for your life. When He gives you opportunity, when He puts that person before you, you know, it's not like I thumped him with a Bible driving down the road, guys. We just had good conversation. But there, you know, your pastor, he'll always put a little something in there, right? <laughs> oh, man. This was no chance opportunity for David either. Here's Saul. Got his pants down. Right? Got his pants down. Squatted down. And here's David in the cave. It's no chance opportunity for David just to kill him. This guy's been chasing me, man. He's been hounding me and chasing me. I can just kill him now. Verse 4. <laughs> Here we go. Then the men of David said to him, all these men, right? This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Whoa, what do you mean? Just cut off the corner of his robe, man. Where's your sword, David? Where's his head? Oh, no, but he just cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went out on his way. Wow. Now evidently sometime, and these men knew about it. There was some time when God told David these words, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, and you can do whatever you want with him then, right? So there was some time, we never really read that, where that was said to him, but there was some time that it must have been said, and these guys knew it. David, David's men figured, hey, this is the time. This is your enemy. This is the time and this is your enemy. Saul was not the enemy and Saul, it was not the time either. This was that, what God had told him was going to be for a later date. It was going to be for another time. It wasn't the time and Saul was not the enemy. Saul was anointed by God as king. For good, better or for worse. Guys, when we have a president, when we have congressmen, whatever they are, they're a bad president, they're good. You have good kings and bad kings. You see it all through the Old Testament. God has put them there. You think about it sometimes to teach the nation, 
See what happens when you walk away from me? I'm going to give you this dude. And that's exactly what Saul was. They wanted a king. They didn't want God to be a king, but he was still anointed by God. And David knew that. And he knew he wasn't truly his enemy. You know, what a, what a heart that man must have had. To say, that's, that's not really my enemy. You know, as Christians, how are we to deal with those we call our enemies? You know? Maybe you have some out there. You got some grudges. How are we to deal with those we call our enemies? Turn your Bibles into Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Paul writes, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Repay no one evil for evil. No one. So how does that work? How do we deal with our enemies? Well, I can't do evil upon them. Evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. <laughs> for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why is it God calls his children, calls the Christian to be a step above? Why is that, man? That's not our flesh. I don't be like that. Repay evil. No evil for evil. But I want to get even, you know. You don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what they said. You don't understand. I want to do that. I want to get back. Repay no evil for evil. What makes our evil works any different than theirs? You got to ask that, right? What makes a Christian any different than theirs? Because we're Christians? Because we're right? No, not at all. Not at all. Evil is evil, church, and sin is sin, right? There is no difference. Evil is evil and sin is sin. We hold no special right to commit evil against evil anyone, against anyone, even if we want to call them our enemy. No. The fact of the matter is you shouldn't have an enemy. You really shouldn't. Our anger never shows the righteousness of God, even if we call it righteous anger, right? In James 1.20, for the wrath of man, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Never has, never will. Uh-uh. Ain't going to happen. Just because we're angry, just because we feel that's an enemy, it will not produce God's righteousness. In verse 18 in Romans, it says right here. Guys, this is a very important verse here. It says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, you live peaceably with all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, See, so much of our disputes, so much of our anger, so much of our struggles and arguments with others depends on how we react. Do you understand what that means? How we react or deal with that offense as much as it depends on you. Guys, you can escalate a situation or you can de-escalate a situation. I'm very good at it. If I want to escalate it, all I got to do is start raising my voice. Rah, get up in your face. And boy, it's going to get up in your face and we're just going to move it on up. Or you can bring it down. Right? You can do as much as it depends on you. You know, you're going to tit or tat for it, right? Tit for tat, tit for tat. We're going to do this. Or are you just going to leave it alone? You're going to let it go away. Oh, man. Why does Jesus tell us? Why does Jesus tell us to bless and pray and forgive our enemies? Think about that. You ever think about that in your mind? Why does, why does Jesus tell us to bless and pray, forgive our enemies? Because God is personal. There again, what do you mean by that, Pastor? God is personal. Well, He cares about you. You guys know, when you harbor something in here, when you harbor bitterness, hate, envy, whatever it is, and it's just, dude, you can't sleep at night because you're thinking about it, it's going through your head, you're running all sorts of scenarios, 
Where's the peace of mind in that? Where's the peace of God? That's why Jesus tells us to forgive. That's why he tells us not to, uh, to bless our enemies, actually. To actually bless our enemies, he tells us that so we have peace of mind. We can go to bed and we can just go, bam, we can sleep. You know, we wake up in the morning and it's a brand new day. There's nothing out there. It gives us peace. See, David could not kill Saul. So what does he do? He cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. That act alone, that act alone, just cutting off his robe, brought remorse to David. Why? Because he was, he was God's anointed. He cut off the robe. I defiled the king's robe, God's anointed man. Now, some people will say, well, how did he do that? How did he get close enough to go cut off that piece of robe? Well, guys, like I say, he had his pants down, right? I don't know if they wore pants. He probably took the robe off, laid it over here, and then walked in the cave a little more to a nice place and did his business, right? So David goes up there, and he just whacks off a piece of material, takes a piece of it off. He couldn't kill Saul, though. See, God was developing a heart in him. I really believe this whole thing was a test for David to be the next king. But he goes, I went against God. I went against God's anointed. You know, God's word said, do not do no harm to my anointed ones. David knew that, knew that uh, psalm, do no harm. David knew it. I think it's a proverb, actually. Anyway, he knew the scripture, and he was doing harm. He was cutting off that cloth. He was cutting the robe. Question is, and this is for us, Here's an application in it. He had remorse just for cutting that robe for crying out loud. Because God commanded, no, don't do that. Don't go against my anointed one. Do we feel same remorse? Do we feel that kind of remorse when we go against God's commandments? Seriously, as Christians, do we feel that? Do we feel that same type of remorse that David did for cutting off a piece of robe? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Do we feel remorse when we go against God's commands? Do we feel remorse when we have hate in our heart, lust in our heart, covetousness in our heart, pride in our heart, bitterness, unforgiveness, lying to people, sexual immorality, stealing, or all any other actions we do? Do we feel the remorse that David did for cutting off that little piece of robe against God? Do these affect us, church? They should. They should. You should feel it. It should convict you. And then it brings you to repentance. And what did David do? He had to repent immediately. Verse 8. Oh, I got to get back to 1 Samuel. We may make it. Okay. Verse 8. What did David do? Repent. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down, literally bowed down before Saul. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, indeed, David seeks you harm? Your harm. Look this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand, into the cave, and someone urged me, well, probably a whole bunch of men urged him, to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, he calls Saul his father. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. He's holding up that material, right? For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. That's how close I were to you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. And I have, I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you, he says. As a proverb of the ancients say, wicked proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? Who are you pursuing, Saul, really? And then he says, 
A dead dog, a flea, that's what David's telling him. He says, that's all I am, I'm nothing. Therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see the plead my, and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. Wow, wow. Guys, you gotta, you gotta picture this, man. You gotta picture this. Here's, here's Saul's thousands, thousands of, of soldiers down there, right? And they're probably down the hill because these caves kind of set up like this. And Saul just stepped out of there after doing his thing. And he's probably going down the hill. And David comes out there, full view, and starts spouting off all this right there. David takes this, I want to say, a crazy step. This dude's been pursuing him for a long time from place to place. He takes this crazy step of coming out of the cave to speak to Saul's heart. You see that? He's speaking to his heart. He humbled himself before Saul. What am I? I am nothing but a dead dog, a flea. First, he starts by bowing to him. He hits the ground before him. He wanted to speak to Saul's heart. Humbling himself before Saul with godly humility, church. Godly humility. Speaking to Saul's heart truth in that humility. You know, some could have said this step of David was foolish. Extremely foolish. If you look at it from a worldly view, it was foolish. I mean, they were all the better in there, right? You gave yourself up, David. Why would you do that? Saul's got you now. Saul has you and your men right where he wants you. Trapped in a cave. There is no back exit to this thing. No way out. You're at his mercy. Why would you do that? I say it was a courageous, godly step David took. Extremely courageous and godly. David put his pride away and humbled himself, church. Huge application in that. He put his pride away and he humbled himself. Not only before his enemy, you see, Saul, but he humbled himself before God also. Do you understand? Do we realize that what we do before men, we also do before God? Whatever it is. What we do before men, we do before God. When we sin against a man, we sin against God, right? When we sin against a man, we sin against God. When we humble ourselves before men, we humble ourselves before the Lord also. All is done before the Lord. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. You humble yourself before somebody else, before a man, before your neighbor, before another Christian. God will lift you up. Humble yourself before the, in the sight of the Lord when you humble yourself before others with godly humility. Let God lift you up. You know, we sung that song, let God fight your battles, right? Let God fight those. So David tells Saul, let God decide. Let God decide how this will go down. In verse 15, we read there, therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. You know, think about it. What faith David had in God, in his Lord, to take that state, step to begin with, right? Right? And then he says, let God decide that what faith he showed by trusting everything to God, everything. You know, David is really a picture of, of trust and faith. You know, I talk about how actually David is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. Many of the things of David is a picture towards Jesus, but he's a picture of trust and faith too. Guys, you know one of my favorite scriptures here, and you know it well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord with your heart. Don't think about it, right? In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Man, I would just, I would pray that we can have just a little bit, maybe, of the trust and faith of David. In verse 16, so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? Man, he calls him his son. Is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and he wept 
He wept. The words of David broke through to the hard heart of Saul. Do you see that? David was like a son to Saul. Before all this came down, Saul loved David. David loved Saul. David's, Saul was like a father to David and, and, and David like a son to Saul. Guys, it always hurts me. It really does. It always hurts my heart when I see a family member whose hearts have been hardened towards one another. Brothers and sisters against, I haven't talked to that guy in 15 years. I ain't got to talk to him. They've hardened up against each other. It bugs me. Hurts my heart. It really does. I haven't talked to mom. I ain't going to talk to my mother. I ain't going to talk to my father. On and on and on. Who'll take the first step? You see, David, he took the step. He went out there and he humbled himself. Who's going to take the first step? Who will humble themselves for the sake of that relationship? And especially family, man. Especially when it comes to family. Who's going to take that first step? Who has the heart of David, right? Who has the heart of Jesus, really? To take that step. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God, the elect of God, church, you're the elect of God. Holy and beloved. You're holy and you're beloved. Put on these things. Tender mercies, kindness, humility. Humility. Godly humility. Meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Do you understand that? Do you understand the forgiveness that my Lord gave me for you too? Do you understand the give, what Jesus did upon that cross as he died for you personally? You also must do. Forgive others. Saul wept. Why? Because he knew David's words were true. He wept. He knew they were true. Verse 17, we're going to finish this up i got just enough time. And then he said to David, you are more righteous than I. Man, he tells David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown the day, this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, you may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know indeed, wow, look what he says here. Saul states it straight up. I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants, not kill all my family after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul and Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold, back up into the cave. These words of Saul, these words by Saul, I want to say, guys, they had, if I didn't know the rest of the story, okay, but I really believe at this time, they were words of true repentance. They were words of repentance. Saul says, you are more righteous than I. Actually puts David above him. These words of Saul was from his heart not that distressing spirit that he'd been dealing with so many times, right? It was from his heart and not of his flesh. Words of repentance, that's what they were. They were from his heart. Man, it's an incredible thing to read from, from Saul himself. It would appear that Saul had that godly sorrow. You see that? Not only did David have the godly humility, but he, Saul had that godly sorrow. Not the sorrow of the world, as it says in Corinthians. In Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry. Paul's writing this. I rejoice that you were actually made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Not that you were made sorry. I don't rejoice that you, you felt bad, right? But your sorrow led you to repentance for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces what? Repentance. That's what Saul was doing, repenting. 
It produces repentance leading to salvation, church, not to be regretted. You will never regret it. You will never regret having godly sorrow over something you've done. When you've sinned against God, sinned against a man, you will not regret it. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Only way I can explain the sorrow of the world is I am sorry I got caught. There's a whole lot of people in prison that have worldly sorrow, and they say, I'm sorry I got caught. They don't have godly sorrow of repentance. Many do also. Don't get me wrong. But many sitting there, man, I shouldn't have got caught. Hmm. This repentance, what we speak of, godly humility, this godly sorrow of Saul, we could only have hope would last, right? <laughs> we know better. <laughs> it's, it's not going to last. You know why? Just like us, the enemy will reignite. The enemy will have a chance to reignite the high hate in Saul. The enemy, that's why I say, you got to be diligent. You got to be sober minded. The enemy's out there to seek and devour you. He's there to reignite that hate. His sorrow was only going to be temporary, it was actually going to be worldly sorrow in reality. You know, godly humility and godly sorrow, church. I want to end with this. I realize I'm running long, but godly humility and godly sorrow, it doesn't come naturally. It's not of our flesh. Do you understand that? It can never be of our flesh. It doesn't come naturally. It only comes in constant communion with our Lord, constant communion with God, in His Word, in prayer, in time of communion with God, in that devotional time. You, you and God together, that's where that godly humility and godly sorrow comes from. Because it's not human. It doesn't come from our flesh. It only comes from that constant communion. You know, and you can't fake it either. You know, some people try to fake that godly humility or that godly sorrow. No, you don't fake things with God, man. You'll be found out in heaven and on earth in reality. You can't fake it. We can't maintain it by ourselves either, right? We need God. We need God to do it for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Wow. I had a whole chapter there. <laughs> Lord, I just thank you, God, for ah, your word. Lord, you just open it up. God, give us that godly humility and godly sorrow, Lord. God, that we would be humble before others. We'd be humble before you before the throne room of God. And Lord, we would love others. And God, if there's any of us here that has a bitterness towards another, I pray, God, that they will, they will seek you tonight before they even go to bed. They'll seek you and then repent of that, of whatever that is. Lord, any bitterness, any hatred, any enemy. And then, God, you will show them you will show them the way to that, uh, well, that godly humility, Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you. Bless our night. In Jesus' name, amen.